when I started investing in real estate about a decade ago, I was in a position where, you know, I didn't have all of the experience. And I went and started yeah. interviewing, connecting directly with mentors and friends, people who had already done it and getting emotional into the experience of what it was like to go through 2008, emotional into the experience of previous recessions and what that felt like and what came up and, and those things. And what it did for me is what, it gave me a position that when those things came up, I had less fear. Welcome back to the Investor Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Pesavento, and today I have Mark Higgins in the studio. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm, I'm super excited to talk with you because you've done what many people don't do. You've taken the time to write a book, let alone a very large book, Right, the, uh, the financial history of the United States. And it's super detailed, it's incredible. We're gonna talk about a lot of the big takeaways today. Uh, but before I get into all that, I wanna start with a personal question. So if we look okay. back to your childhood, what events or influences from your childhood shaped who you are today? You know, I, I've always been, I, I don't know if there's a single event, but I've always been somebody who was intellectually curious. Uh, the joke, people used to call me question mark. I'd always a ask a million questions and wanted to figure out everything, how, how everything worked. So, you know, I, I was always, academics were kind of naturally suited to me because it, it's constantly learning new things. So there wasn't one event, but I've been somebody who's been intellectually curious their whole life. Yeah. I, I think there's something really powerful about that because when you can look at how you were acting as a kid, what continues to repeat, you can start thinking, okay, well, you know, that's something that people either loved or was annoying about something that I did. And I did the same yeah. thing. I always asked why, what's the reason? I need to know more information, yeah. <laughs> but that it's actually a superpower and it's led you down this road to being able to answer questions and help advise people. So um, from the perspective of this book, what led you down the path of wanting to put together the whole history of uh, finance in the US? So it wasn't, I, I, I've never written, a, this is my first book. Now I've, I've been writing a lot in my career in different positions for a long time. So that wasn't really that much of a stretch, but it really started in March, 2020 when COVID hit. And at the time I was an investment consultant advising large institutional plans like foundations, endowments and foundation and, and uh, pension funds. And I was caught pretty flat footed when, when that happened. And, I started reading, and I forget what prompted it. I think it was something that Ray Dalio said about the importance of understanding history. And I started reading financial history books just to get a sense of if, if anything like this happened before. And the more I was reading, the more I realized that that was actually much more useful in advising clients than just kind of keeping track of the markets and really relying only on your, your personal experience. So at some point, what I discovered was I, I, I actually couldn't believe that there was no book on the complete financial history of the United States. I mean, there are great, there are, uh, yeah, I've read probably 200 at this point. There, there are great books out there, but they're usually very period specific. And there are some that, that go maybe a hundred years, but nothing that, that went from 1790 to 2023. So at least in a single volume, there's one out there with like a, you know, seven different books, but at least in a single volume. So I, I mean, I decided to take a shot at it. I knew it was an ambitious endeavor, but writing is a skill that I've had. I've always been intellectually curious and I took a shot at it. It took about three and a half years. I, like I said, I've, I've read more than you can imagine. I used to sit on the couch during the weekend and read newspapers from the 1800s and 1900s to get a sense of what it was really like to live then. And what I really tried to do with this book is take all of that and synthesize it into here's what was really important that happened you, you know from 1790 to 1865 when the foundation was set for the um for the u.s financial system and really synthesize it so people don't have to go out and read 200 books like i did well, i think it's such a powerful thing to do because you've read all these books you synthesize it into one book that somebody can sit down and read although it's a significant book to read 500 and some pages I haven't finished it myself. hundred with graphics. But I haven't finished it. I haven't finished it myself. But I've read through quite a bit. And what I love yeah. about the concept, and that's the important thing I think from this, is 
When I started investing in real estate about a decade ago, I was in a position where, you know, I didn't have all of the experience. And I went and started yeah. interviewing, connecting directly with mentors and friends, people who had already done it, and getting emotional into the experience of what it was like to go through 2008, emotional into the experience of previous recessions and what that felt like and what came up and, and those things. And what That's it great. did for me is it gave me a position that when those things came up, I had less fear because I was recognizing something that was you nailed similar. It. I mean, you absolutely and nailed so it. And that, so that, that what, what yeah. can people Sorry, do using this information to be able to not only be better investors, but to be able to be better emotionally connected to the decisions they make? Yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it. That's exactly what I hope to do with this book is to allow people to supplement their memory. Many, most investors rely on their personal experience and maybe their education goes back call it 50 years, but they haven't, they haven't put together the full experience, the financial experience of the United States. And my hope with this book is that people will be able to use this to recognize things that are happening in the present, tie it back to something that happened in the past. And you can't predict the future entirely. You, you can't do it precisely, but you can narrow down the scenarios. And a lot of what happened in COVID-19 where, I mean, I'm on the record in, in writing, um, it, it, was, it was very similar to some past events and it, and it helped me um, forecast what was what, what would likely happen. I, I think that's a perfect place to start because I want to go through some examples of current and connect them some of these examples from the past to give people a little feeling. But COVID-19, yeah. you know, this comes up. We've never closed the economy the way that we did as quickly as we did. Um, but what happened in COVID and what times in history is that similar to? So, so first of all, we did close things like we did during COVID. So that, that's an important yeah, point. Right there. The, the good comparable there is July 1914, at the end of July 1914, when World War One broke out. Mm. Nobody saw that coming because it was it was prompted by an assassination that people d didn't really think was a big deal, but it kind of all these existing defense packs got triggered and all of a sudden out of nowhere in a month, the entire European continent was essentially at war. And the reaction was very similar. I mean, people just went into a complete panic. The New York Stock Exchange shut down and for, for four and a half months. Um, but a lot of the tactics that were used to, to make sure that there wasn't a complete financial implosion were also used in July 1914. So again, if you had, and there's another important point that the panic of 1907 had happened recently. Mm -hmm. So the government was pre and was predisposed to using aggressive tactics because they had just done it. Mm. Same thing with the global financial crisis. And that's why we were, act, we, we were able to act so quickly in 2020. So there actually is a comparable for that. And, but you know, another important point from history is it's tempting to think that some events going to repeat entirely, you know, similarly to a previous event, but you have to piece them together. So mm. that was kind of the onset of the crisis, but, the comparable once we reached April 2021 and inflation was starting to heat up was the post World War One great influenza inflation that happened in 1919 and 1920. And the Fed reacted the same way. They were very aggressive, raised rates by 225 basis points within six months. And it actually triggered a, a nasty but relatively short recession. So I, I, I'll, I'll stop there because there, there are other comparables we can get into. But there really isn't anything that happened over the past four years that's that was unprecedented, but it's not a single event. You have to know three or four events and know how to piece them together. That's, so that's the key, right? It's easy to say, hey, well, yeah. we didn't do it exactly like this, but we can look at those different examples and how that actually influenced. So what happened in World War I or after World War I and how does that relate to what could potentially so, happen today? There were a lot of similarities and I, and I do detail them in the book, but some of the most important were during the war, the United States didn't get involved in the war until 1917, but during the war there, were, there was rationing, and, but there was also a lot of, believe it or not, wealth accumulation in the United States. And then, then when the pandemic hit, it, you actually weren't allowed to talk about it because of censorship in, in, the, in the press, but you know, people knew that there were a lot of people getting sick and dying around them. So, there was a lot of pent up savings. And once the war and great influenza, the second wave ended simultaneously, all of a sudden it got unleashed, mm. which was a lot. I mean, it was a complete mirror image of what happened after 
it wasn't there wasn't an exact date, but call it around April uh, 2021 when when people started getting comfortable that we were we were kind of toward the end of the acute phase, and that and that pent up savings started getting spent. So it was really the same underlying dynamic that caused these two inflations. And when the Fed said, "Now I, I was admitted, I wish I trust my int- instinct more because I was making that comparison," but the Fed kept assuring people that you know it's going to be. Um, the what was the what was the transitory the the inflation was going to be transitory but if the 1919 and 1920 inflation was really the comparable which i strongly believe it was um it wasn't going to be transitory now it wasn't going to be like the 1960s and 1970s of course if the if the fed did the right thing but you know saying it was going to be three or four months was was probably not going to be accurate and so knowing that information let's say we we feel really confident in it we believe it's going to be similar to that past event what can an investor do with that information to be able to either hold tight, make you know, changes? Well, I, I have, there, there's the temptation to think that you can trade on it. And there probably are some people out there that can trade on it and, and make a profit. But I, the, the vast majority, and these are the types of people that I serve institutions, are not equipped to do that. Mm-hmm. What the usefulness of it is that it, it can help you contextualize what's happening now to demystify it so that they don't panic mm. and you know do something that they're going to regret reduce equities because the whole world seems to be falling apart you, you know it, it's most useful in grounding people calming people and reassuring them that we have seen something like this before and the world is not going to end because a lot of times people react the biggest mistake that i see in investing is when there's a crisis like like COVID nineteen and people sell all their stocks at their at, at the worst possible time mm-hmm. and it's very helpful in, in preventing people from doing that. Yeah, because what I've seen, right? I run a private equity real estate company. We invest in 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 real yep. estate assets and some businesses. And what I saw was, you know, a lot of our clients were very scared. They were very concerned. Yeah. They fortunately don't have an option to be able to exit, which has its pros and its cons. But because of that. They didn't. They weren't able to make that decision. But if it was a public equity, they may have liquidated uh, right before you know something great could yeah. potentially happen. It happens all the time in a very an emotional yeah. way. Yep, it happens all the time, and that is, I, I believe that that's the for the for the majority of people that is the greatest value of understanding financial history. When you've walked from 1790 to today. You see these panics every 10 years or so. And to be honest with you, I, I, to be fair, the global finance, the last two we had were actually pretty significant, mm-hmm. even by historical standards. But we've also learned to deal with them. I mean, if this had happened in the 1800s, we would have been we, we would be in a major depression. That's what happened back mm-hmm. then. So, And the Great Depression, by the way, was not the first depression. It was probably the, I, I would argue, it was the third Great Depression. But some would argue it's the fourth. But Anyway. So let's talk about what is happening today that's different from what had happened in the past that had led to those types of depressions. So the two major mistakes of oh sorry, the two major mistakes of the Federal Reserve and uh, the federal government were in the 1930s not stopping the depression and, and particularly the bank runs that occurred in the early 1930s. And really, the great inflation is their second big mistake, which was the inflation that lasted from 1965 to 1982. So if you look at the past 20 years, learning from the mistakes of the Great Depression and acting aggressively, not quite as quickly as I would have hoped, but acting aggressively in the face of the global financial crisis, it absolutely prevented another Great Depression. We would have gone into a Great Depression if there wasn't intervention. And... Now, what you're seeing now, the the verdict's not out, but the big lesson from the great inflation was you need to nip inflation in the bud early because once it becomes entrenched, it, it it's really it's very hard to get rid of, and that's why Paul Volcker had to raise rates all the way up to twenty percent in the early 1980s to get rid of it because it had prolo- it had gone so long and it was so entrenched. So, I th- there can be arguments on whether the the federal government you know, hit it perfectly or, um, you know, did too much or too little for these events. But compared to what happened when they didn't do this, it, it, they, they've, they learned a lot. And I think they did the right thing to, to stop the global financial crisis from spiraling into a Great Depression. And they seem to be doing the right thing in terms of maintaining tight monetary policy 
until inflation is decisively extinguished. So I know the book goes all the way back to the 1700s, but the major areas that I pulled out was World War I, World War II, the Great Depression and the Great Inflation. Is there any others? Yeah. And do you want to kind of walk us through chronologically, maybe a very high level overview of what happened and how that could relate to today? Yeah, I mean, the World War One, we, we probably talked about it a bit in terms of the what's relevant to today is mostly the, um, you know, the the the, the reaction to inf the post-war inflation, um, the Great Depression. The a lot of people, I think the big lesson of the Great Depression that people don't appreciate is World War II was really the consequence of the Great Depression. And, you know, people often think of depressions as the loss of money. But the real danger is the fabric of society gets torn apart. Mm. And you've probably read this chapter, but it goes through how the Great Depression, Hitler was on his last legs in the late 1920s. And Japan was not in the position it was in by, by the, in the early 30s as it was in the, in the late 1930s. And, and the book explains why. But it was really the Great Depression that enabled the Nazis to take power and inspired the Japanese mil militarists to invade China and move through Southeast Asia. So that was the big lesson from when I was reading about it that I didn't realize is you think of the Great Depression and, oh, you don't want people to you know, lose a lot of money. And that's true. But the real risk is society, the fabric of society starts tearing apart. Desperate people will do desperate things. And that that the Great Depression was absolutely the primary cause of World War Two. Mm -hmm. And we're not there yet, but you can absolutely start to see that fabric of society starting to pull apart, which could lead to, you know, any type of, you know, hot or cold war or negative things that could happen for us. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that because I, I thought a lot about that. And there there are some people that are comparing what's happening now to the 1930s. I actually don't see that. The it seems bad now. You know, imagine 20 percent average unemployment mm -hmm. for a decade. Yeah. And things were a lot worse in the 1930s than they are now. It, it strikes me more of what we're going through as the 1960s and 1970s, where you have kind of cultural clashes and, you know, there's a, there's an inflation element here as well. That I, I, it's not a direct comparison, but that that strikes me as the better comparable than the 1930s. I, I don't see our, we have a stronger, much stronger economy, better employment situation, much better than we did in the 1930s. So, yeah, I, I don't see that comparison. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are elements, but not, that doesn't seem like the strongest comparison. To me. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I don't necessarily disagree. I just think that idea that if we end up getting to a point where not only is the economy collapsing, but also is that social fabric that's bringing everyone together yeah. to unite them in one direction, that we've already got some of that starting to build. But um, yeah. you're the financial no, historian do. here, so. You know, I mean, we do. I mean, there are elements of it. and But if I had to pick the most comparable, it would be the 60s and 70s. But yeah, there. I mean, there are, there are elements of some of the polarization that you saw in the in the 1930s. You're definitely seeing that now. And so, what happened after that? Happened after the 1930s, 1960s, 1970s. Oh, so I'm sorry. So, um, well, moving ahead. So the last section of the book really details. There, there's an important point that I, I had never seen talked about, and I found this this obscure book that kind of detailed it by Frank Vanderloop, who was a, who, he was a famous financier in the early 1900s. Uh, it was called The American Commercial Invasion of Europe. And it was a 10 year period that started in 1896 and ended in 1906, where we essentially took over as the world's workshop. And a lot of that was related to being able to produce interchangeable parts in mass. And it sounds very boring, but that's what did it. And the chapter is called The American Commercial Invasion. So the opening chapter in the last section is called the second American commercial invasion, and it tracks the development of Silicon Valley. And that has really, as everybody knows, has shaped the economy that we're in today, and also shaped an important bubble that we experienced at the, the end of the 1900s. So the last section, I mean, there, there are a bunch of different parts, but that's a key part was the development of the technology industry in the United States. 
Another key part is some of the new asset classes like private equity and hedge funds and why institutions started piling into them, which I would argue they are way overexposed mm -hmm. at this point. And I, and I go into some of the reasons why. And then the last few chapters are really on the crises, the global financial crisis, which was a very significant crisis. It, it reminded me a little more of the panic of 1907, well, a lot more of the panic of 1907 than the Great Crash in 1929 because it was a big shadow banking problem. The name of the chapter is actually the, the Great Shadow Bank Run. And the, the dot com, now that was, it was more of an isolated type bubble, but you know, that was an important event that, that I talk about in that chapter. And then it ends with COVID. And the cool thing about, I mean, I don't want to say COVID's cool, obviously it was a horrible event, but the interesting thing about COVID is it explains, the, the last chapter explains the initial shock, the inflation that we experienced, the, the, the Federal Reserve's response and what's what, what they're thinking about really in terms of not repeating the 60s and 70s, all in the context of history. And when you read that chapter, it's kind of like, you know, I'm outlining the different things that are happening and say, you know, refer to chapter X, refer to chapter Y. It's the same thing over again. If, and, and you can see it in the different chapters that I reference. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So obviously we get into a lot of examples, but what I'm curious about you have a, a unique perspective in the institutional world, right? You're very focused on, hey, the index is actually a better tool than having these institutions yes. invest in a private equity. Obviously, I have a somewhat of a disagreement, although what I agree on is that if you don't invest in the right private equity companies in the best managers, then you absolutely won't get those types of returns because it's a much harder yeah. business. So let's talk First, what is the difference in how an institution should be thinking about investing their wealth versus a high net worth individual? And how can they use the information that you've been able to discover to be able to make those decisions? So the, the issue with institutions, the, the primary issue with institutions is they have unstable governance. So, and you don't see this until you've been doing it long enough, but pension plans and endowments and foundations, they, they circulate trustees called every four or five years. So the problem is they can invest in a strategy that if they had stable governance may make sense, but somebody unwinds it at the, at the wrong time four or five years later. So it's kind of a unique challenge and index funds kind of act like a hedge against that, right? If you're just tracking the index, you're not, you're going to hedge that risk that something's going to be unwound at the wrong time. And with respect to, to alternative asset classes, this is a, you see these, there, there are long wave cycles that you see in history. You saw it with whaling and you, you, you see it where these products, it just takes a couple decades for them to run through their cycle. And the alternatives boom really started in the 1990s, uh, really, actually probably more right around the turn of the century because of David Swenson at Yale. Mm -hmm. So David Swenson was the chief, uh, the former, he passed away recently, but the uh, chief investment officer at Yale, who has had exceptional returns for, I don't know, call it around 35 years at this point, is that uh, actually more than 40 years at this point. And what, what people got wrong, in my opinion, is they, David Spencer wrote a book detailing his strategy. It, it was published in 2000. And people assumed that he made, they, they did make very good returns by investing in private equity in buyout funds in hedge funds, although it's a very specific type of hedge fund and, and venture capital. And people read the book and assumed if we just do that, we can get Yale like returns. And what was missing, and I, and I detail this in four pages. Um, I read, you know, countless Yale, uh, endowment annual reports, and, and talk to a few people at Yale. And what, what they were missing is you first have to get the infrastructure to make sure you can do it right. And that infrastructure includes a very talented investor on top who can mentor and develop replacements. So you kind of, you're constantly refreshing the team. That's somebody who can manage, manage the governance. So you don't have people, you know, abandoning the strategy or forcing change to the strategy. And that's really what Yale had and has that is very difficult to replicate. And could you replicate the Yale strategy? Yes, but it, you, you, you can't do it with having that infrastructure of people management uh, in place first. And, and that's the mistake that people are making. It's not that private equity is, you know, every private equity fund is not worth that. I, I know that's not true. I mean, Yale's proven it's not true. But if you are not a skilled investor and have an infrastructure that is durable, 
it's a very dangerous place to put your money. So from your perspective, what I'm really understanding, what I'm hearing is that you're saying, hey, well, all these institutions said Yale did a great job at this and a few other big institutions followed suit and they also got disproportionately higher returns. But the difference was that they had the infrastructure in place. They were yes, choosing the exactly. right managers and the organization as a whole understood both the duration and the focus and strategy needs to stay consistent. It can't just change every exactly. couple of years. Otherwise, you miss out on the biggest return potential exactly. that could come. And, so it's not that, necessarily that the yeah. strategies are bad. It's that if implemented incorrectly, it's like using a, a hammer to try to paint the wall. You're going to have some pretty bad results. But yes. And, it, and it's especially dangerous in alternatives because you know, if you pick a wrong active manager in large cap equity, I mean, maybe they underperform, but it's not going to be massive. If you pick the wrong private equity firm or venture capital firm, I, I, you know, their returns versus the top the bottom quartile versus the top quartile is enormous. So you can really mess up badly. Yeah, it blows me away when I look at the projected returns of venture capital and the average returns. I often think to myself, well, I don't even, I'd only invest in this for fun because it almost seems like, <laughs> why would I take that kind of risk when I, I could buy a hard asset or yeah. I could go into the kind of a traditional market and get something that's a lot more stable but it is kind yeah. of sexy to say that you're invested in something, you know, that is a, yeah. a name brand uh, startup. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to the alternatives, the David Swenson came out and said this as well. You know, toward the end of his uh, career, uh, he was saying that most institutions are better off indexing everything and avoiding alternatives, not because it's an automatic, you know, death sentence to get into these. It's it's more because it's just, it's just, you have to have that infrastructure and most don't. And so why don't people do that? Why don't the institutions do that? And then let's separately talk about the individuals and how they can use it. Because this. nobody's telling them not to. Uh, you know, I, it, from what I've observed is looking at the investment consulting industry's evolution, staff serving uh, large institutions as well. There's an incentive to maintain the status quo if only because going to something more simpler, something more simple and, and less complex and, and less costly, I'm sorry. It, there's the fear that you're gonna you're you're gonna be obsolete mm -hmm. and out of a job or you know you're gonna lose a client. And and I talk about this a little in the opening of the book. The that, that was my fear when I started moving clients to more simple allocations. And the truth is that forces you to find a new way to add value. And there are plenty of ways for advisors of institutions and individuals to add value. And it becomes clear what some of these are uh, once, once you admit what you can't do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, my experience and my observations from, from reading history is most people are unwilling to do people that. People are afraid of losing their job. I think a lot of traditional financial yeah. advisors on the individual side have kind of the same perspective because, yeah. you know, if I'm going into the stock market, I'm either picking stocks individually that I personally believe in, I have some industry knowledge about, and I'm gonna hold it for a very long time, or I'm gonna index. Mm -hmm. And so when I meet people and they're paying a financial advisor and it's a you know a fee-based revenue and it's not like a fixed fee for advice, mm -hmm. I often think, well, that, that seems silly from my perspective. On the private side, although I do run a private equity company and I do manage you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of people's money, mm -hmm. I also at the same time will not personally invest in other managers that are not top performers. And it's very difficult yeah. for people to know the difference. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I see in the industry is my team will be talking directly with, with our clients and we hear about some of the managers that they're investing in and i personally know that they're not doing a good yeah. job and it's a difficult yeah. industry because it's hard to be able to speak up against your competition negatively because our perspective is we're very much like hey we just want to partner with you and do good things together yeah. we don't want that energy of us versus them but yet it's difficult to get an average person to understand that there is truly a difference in who's actually making yeah. those decisions yeah, I mean, I I never looked at it really as an option. I yeah, I had and have a fiduciary duty to recommend what is in the best interest of clients, and if it is not in their best interest to have a lot of active managers in the portfolio that are not 
long term expected to outperform if the structure is not there to allocate to alternatives in a way that is expected to be beneficial, then it's my obligation to tell them that. And and when I did, they appreciate that. And you start looking for new ways to add value. So there, you know, a lot of, particularly with institutions, there are often multiple pools of capital. And what I found was that, well, once we simplified one, now they wanted me to advise them on others. So it, a lot of times your relationship actually expands and, and becomes better once you admit what you can't do. That, yeah. That's been my experience. I think the average person, from my perspective, if you don't have some type of financial education or personal relationships with people who have strong track records, the simplest mm -hmm. option is 100% the best option. And even yeah. with those relationships, you know, I would never recommend somebody invest 100% of their money into our firm, nor would we allow it. Um, yeah. But when it comes to balancing a portfolio, how do institutions look at it and how do individuals look at it? I know you're very focused on the institutional side. I mean, my, my experience is mostly, yeah, I'm, I'm very skewed toward institutions, so I can say probably less about individuals. But the biggest problem that I saw with uh, institutions is the eagerness to get into areas that they're not prepared to get in like we, we like we talked about the over i mean if you look at pension plans the allocation to alternatives i don't have the precise numbers but it was negligible 20 years ago and now it's i think it's somewhere around 20 percent in alternatives and there's no way you can convince me that most of those institutions have the appropriate infrastructure to do that effectively and, I, and you know there's a lot of evidence coming out now too that it, it it's not paying off in aggregate are there certain institutions that are doing it effectively sure i mean yale is one of them mm. but in aggregate they're not so what value do, does a what value does a financial advisor who's going to direct people into index funds bring to an institution versus their ability to go to vanguard or any of these other options and and go direct and, that, and that's well that was the question where i where i, where I thought i was going to get uh, you know maybe they terminate me because they wouldn't need me but there's some there's coordination of other asset pools and in, in institutions that have multi asset pools. You know, it was almost like I morphed into more of a financial advisor for institutions rather than just an investment advisor for institutions. So there was a, an insurance captive that I worked with and did a lot to understand their their cash flows and risk to understand what the risk profile should should be. So um, there are other things to do. It's going to vary by institutions, but the way I would say it generally is a lot of investment consulting firms limit themselves to just being the investment piece. But once you broaden it to become more of a financial advisor, there are things that have nothing to do with an investment, but have a lot to do with how to manage your organization financially that they need advice on and, and you focus more on that. So overall, your philosophy is simplify your portfolio as much as possible. I also, in I might be wrong here, I'm also gathering that your perspective is take the very amount, the least amount of risk possible and hedge yourself against against what's happening in the market? Well, I mean, it, it not necessarily. So understanding what your return objectives are and your return objectives are, you, you know, long term objectives versus your risk tolerance, which is pretty much how much can you stomach if everything, you know, goes crazy and, and you have a big you have a crisis, you have a big drop. And so a lot of that is really how much equity you have in the portfolio. So there's a lot of discussion on how much equity risk can you afford because long term that's going to produce better returns uh, that are expected to produce better returns in the, in the very long term. And you can go long periods where it doesn't, but in the very long term, it will. Um, and then, you know, another thing that, that and then setting an allocation, you know, we use domestic equity, international equity, some real estate and, and fixed income. And that's that's pretty much it. And um, but another thing that often gets neglected, which is extremely valuable, is rebalancing the portfolio religiously, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's quarterly, every six months or, or annual, to maintain the desired return and, and risk expectations of the portfolio. And a lot of that, believe it or not, gets neglected because there's it's, it's very hard to rebalance a portfolio that's very complicated. So that's another benefit of simplifying the portfolio in liquid asset classes, you can rebalance. And that, that is extremely important to maintain the desired return and, and risk exposures. So kind of shifting gears a little bit here, the Fed has 
you know, raised rates extremely fast over the last couple of years. We're in an environment where it's unclear exactly what's going to happen. There's a likelihood that rates are going to stay higher for longer. There's a potential that rates might start coming down. How does fixed income or bonds play a role into a portfolio? And how are you personally thinking about it today? Because from a a long-term bond perspective, it's very difficult from my perspective from, from my opinion, to be able to understand, well, what is, where are things really going to go and, and how do I bake that into my portfolio so I'm not upset? Yeah, down? I mean, it's, it's less focused on that and more the, the role of fixed income in a, in a portfolio is to provide a cushion when you have, when you have panics and when you have major draw down, drawdowns in equity. So we're not really thinking about, you know, do we change our allocation to fixed income based on where we think rates are going to go? It's more a steady and durable cushion that you have in the portfolio. So it, it's not really influencing our allocation decisions. And what's the typical range? Obviously, every client's going to have a unique situation. But what's the typical range that, that these institutions are looking for in that bucket? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the institution. But um, generally, they, they can take more risk than individuals. I mean, I guess it depends on, <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. I mean, young, indiv- young people can take a lot of risk. But, um, you know, there, there's there's typically a lot of equity risk, although you do have some, sometimes you have institutions with operating capital that, you know, you're just going to put it in fixed income essentially. But uh, so it varies a lot, but I would say generally institutions have more risk tolerance than, than most individuals, maybe with the exception of people that are very early in their career and and their retirement accounts. And what is, how would someone from a numeric percentage perspective, what's a range that somebody would say, hey, well that they're, they're willing to take a lot of risk. So they only have this allocation. What does that look like? If you're in the 70% equity, 80% equity exposure, that's, that's pretty high. I mean, there are some people out there that'll go hundred percent. There aren't many out there that are willing to do that, but you know, kind of 70, 80% equity exposure. That makes sense. Well, I know we're getting to the end of time here. So what I'd love to talk about is after doing all this work, writing this book, researching all this information about history, you've suggested some changes from an institutional level on investing in indexes. What were some other big takeaways from the book that you feel like is important for listeners to understand before they dive in and read? The, you, well, that's a good question. And uh, I'm glad you asked it at the end. So the, if there's one thing that is unprecedented, that is not getting, it's getting more attention now, but it, it was striking starting from 1790 and going to today, it stood out, it, it really stood out. And that is the attitude toward the public debt. And yeah. if you look back at 1790, what Alexander Hamilton did, we were a disaster. I mean, we were bonds and by issued by the states to fund the war. We're trading at 10, 20 cents on the dollar. And Alexander Hamilton, this is the first chapter of the book, established, uh, first of all, he established a central bank. He consolidated all of the state debt into federal debt and then raised tariffs to make sure that we could pay it down. And in that first report on, on the public credit, which he delivered to Congress, he also started kind of an informal precedent that the public credit was critical, but it was only to be used during emergencies, mostly foreign war. And we abided by that. So we ran up the debt in the War of 1812, we paid it back. Ran up the debt in the Civil War, paid it back. World War I, same thing, paid it back. And we stopped after World War II. And the reason is because we were abnormally wealthy and that emboldened us to spend in ways that we had never spent before. And we've been doing that now for, for 60 years. And you know, it, it's funny because a lot of the debate hones in on the, you know, spending too much during the COVID-19 pandemic and spending too much during, you know, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. But the real problem, those were actually legitimate emergencies. Mm-hmm. The, the real po- problem was running deficits in years when we didn't mm-hmm. need to. And this is a very difficult problem to solve because there aren't any Americans alive today who remembers what it was like to live within our means. You'd have to go back to the really the 1920s because we were deficit spending during the, the Great Depression as well. So I, I don't know how you solve this problem, but I do know that it, the math doesn't work. If we keep spending at this level, we are going to have a problem. Now, is it going to be tomorrow? No. Is it going to be in 10 years? Maybe. Is it going to be in 30 years? If we keep going at this rate, yes. And 
uh, that's a big problem to solve. And, and um, it's one that a lot of people don't appreciate how severe it is because they don't, they, there's nobody alive today that remembers what it was like to spend with, with in our means. But that's what we did for 175 years. Yeah, it's a huge problem. But what kind of problems could that bring up for investors? And how should they be thinking about that as we head into the next coming decades? Yeah, I mean, from an investment perspective, that one, I, I can't see how you would trade on it because to trade on it would be to have assumptions as to how it's going to play out. And I don't think anybody can make a projection. All The only thing that's really apparent is if we keep spending at this rate, it doesn't mm-hmm. work. But the United States have a, has a good habit of when we're forced to address things, we do address them. But how and when it plays out, I, I, I don't see how anybody could make a reasonable prediction yeah. on that. Predicting the future is what investors often <laughs> want to do, but unfortunately we can't, we can only uh, react yeah. and, and prepare. You, you can get, I mean, where you could where you could get a good sense was, it was pretty clear that the, the, that the Fed, if you knew, that they knew that about the big mistakes that they made in the 60s and 70s, which you, you do know they know because you can look at the minutes and and, and see them referencing it. it. It wasn't too hard to tell in it, it, when they started raising rates that they meant mm-hmm. business. And, you know, I'm on record as saying that and um, in writing. So, but it was clear, pretty clear, not because, you know, I'm, I'm some masterful genius or anything. It's just because I read about and knew that they knew what what they had to avoid mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, and you know that's the value of studying financial history yeah. well it's super valuable i've got one last question before we wrap up but why don't you tell people how they can follow you or uh, or get a copy of the book sure the easiest way to follow me is probably on linkedin that's where i post most of my stuff i do have a newsletter um if you go to substack and just you know look up fin history you'll find it and then the book is available on amazon barnes and noble bookstores are starting to to hold it. I just got a notice from Powell's books, which is big mm. in Portland, Oregon, that they're going to be stocking it. Um, so, you know, it's pretty easy to find if, if you're interested and I hope people get value out of it. Yeah. Well, this has been really great, Mark. Oh, oh sorry. The book is called the, uh, <laughs> I can't see it Investing. It's getting blocked. But anyway, hopefully you can help it, it up, Steve. It's investing, investing in, in U.S. US financial history. It's available everywhere books are sold. And uh, no, I really appreciate you being on. I'd love to get deeper and, you know, uh, into the history, maybe in another episode in the future. But thanks for giving us a great overview of kind of what's happening as we wrap up on this topic. Somebody's listening to this. They're thinking to themselves, hey, there's so much information out there, but I... I just don't know how to take action and actually put this stuff into practice. What advice would you give them after all the research you've done in order to actually step into taking control of their you know, financial future? That it, it is extremely difficult to outperform the market, even for people that do this every day, that for the average person, their best bet is to use index funds and to allocate in a way that they're 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 getting their best odds of hitting their long-term return objectives but at a risk level where they're not going to be impaired uh if there's a major event and if you can do that it's not it doesn't have to be that complicated i think that's the solution for most people simple patient and uh read the book yes and don't get spooked i've seen enough of these things to know that it's scary when they happen But the United States, the world, is more resilient than people think. And um, to be honest with you, people who, every generation thinks the world's gonna fall apart. That's another thing that came from reading newspapers. Every generation thinks the whole world's gonna fall apart after, you you know, they're the last one to have a a good (laughs) life. And it never plays out. And um, uh, this whole process made me a lot more confident in, in America's future, even though it seems bad right now and in it there are bad things now but it's always there's always something and um that's what gives me confidence that we're gonna be fine i love it the future looks bright well thanks mark super appreciate you being on all right thanks steve thanks for having me this is fun and uh we'll see you all next week thanks for listening to the investor mindset podcast make sure to hit that subscribe button and if you'd like to watch another here's one up top and here's another great video right down below.